there remains one more element in this second step, the step of understanding and formalizing the arguments that we identify in bits of spoken and written language. And that has to do with being able to understand and appreciate the difference between deductive inferential claims and inductive inferential claims, and make sure that when we formulate our argument that the nature of the inferential claim is manifest in how we structure and present the argument. After we're done with that, we'll turn our attention to that next step of evaluating arguments. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on deductive arguments, and we're going to be using a method that you actually use in everyday life, the counterexample method. We'll, of course, approach it in a much more systematic fashion, but we're just using a technique that you probably have used yourself many times in your life. As we turn our attention to that first task of delimiting and differentiating inductive inferential claims from deductive inferential claims, we'll of course notice that deductive inferential claims mirror that relationship between initial information and the information that results from that inferential transformation in a deductive inference, just as inductive claims mirror that inferential transformation when we make inductive inferences. But we're going to want to discuss our deductive and inductive inferential claims in a way that really tries to emphasize and illustrate that underlying connection between the logical form, the structural elements of the argument or the inference, and its content, the truth or falsity of the initial information. And we're going to want to do that particularly when we're talking about arguments, because we're going to want to focus in on the impact that these claims have on the normative force of argumentation. So one way we can keep the nature of deductive and inductive inferential claims in our mind is to anthropomorphize them so that we have a sort of mnemonic device for reminding ourselves of their essential features. And when I think about deductive inferential claims, I think about them as these hardworking, burly dock worker types, right, who in their raspy voices proclaim, real logicians use deductive arguments where the truth of the premises necessitates the truth of the conclusion. Whereas our inductive argument is much more of a sort of beanie-wearing, improvisational, jazz-loving creature who will tell us that Inductive arguments are the ones where the truth of the premises only renders the conclusion highly likely to be true. And I want to emphasize the seriousness and the rigidity of deductive inferential claims and the normative impact of a perceived successful deductive argument. And to do that, I'm going to do a little aside into the history of the philosophy of religion. This fellow here is Barak de Espinosa. He was one of the first rationalist philosophers. He wrote in the Netherlands during the Dutch Golden Age at the beginning of the 17th century. And as part of his writings, he introduced and elaborated upon an argument that was already known in Western philosophy of religion prior to this time. In fact, it dated back at least to much earlier in the Middle Ages, when scholars were thinking about the nature of God, trying to understand God's nature in a real and consistent way. And one of the things that they were thinking about was how should we understand God's omnipotence? And this argument purports to show that that notion is incoherent, that we can't actually make sense of God's omnipotence. And so the argument can be read as follows. If God exists, then God is omnipotent. If God were omnipotent, though, then God could create a stone that was so heavy that God could not lift that stone. After all, God can create anything. God is all-powerful, so God should be able to create that stone so heavy God can't lift it. But wait a minute now. If God could create a stone, so heavy that God couldn't actually lift that stone. Then by creating that stone, God would create a limitation on God's own powers. God can't lift the stone, so now there's something God can't do, and hence God really isn't superlatively potent. And so line four of the argument says, look, given line three, then God wouldn't be omnipotent since there would be something for which God lacks that power. And wait, that can't be right. 
the argument says. If God could create a stone that was so heavy that God couldn't lift it, thereby negating God's own omnipotence, then it must be the case that God couldn't create that stone. Yeah, but then God's powers are limited all over again, and God ceases to be omnipotent. Therefore, when we consider that relationship between the consequences in line four and line five, it seems like there's no way that God can be omnipotent. Either God can create the stone, in which case God has limitations and no longer looks omnipotent, or God can't create the stone, in which case God has limitations and no longer looks omnipotent. Therefore, God cannot be omnipotent. And if God cannot be omnipotent, since omnipotence is a central property of God, God, as we understand that entity, doesn't exist. So how did Spinoza's religious community react to his argument to the effect that the deity as conceived by their church didn't in fact exist? Well, they didn't react well. This is part of the text of Spinoza's excommunication from his church. By decree of the angels and by command of the holy men, we excommunicate, expel, and curse Barak de Spinoza, cursing him with the excommunication with which Joshua banned Jericho, and with the curse which Eliza cursed the boys, and with all the castigations which are written in the book of the law. Cursed be he by day, and cursed be he by night. Cursed be he when he lies down, and cursed be he when he rises up. Cursed be he when he goes out, and cursed be he when he goes in. So they were pretty upset. But it's important to recognize that when Spinoza wrote this, the European Inquisitions were in full force. The European Inquisitions had begun around 1250 in France and in Italy, and that they continued on really until Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. And in fact, many people were burned at the stake for committing heresies like what Spinoza had done. Not everyone, of course. And if we want to ask, why is it that they didn't punish Spinoza in a more severe fashion? Why is it, for instance, that they didn't do anything more severe to Galileo than put him under house arrest. I think the answer is the normative force of a deductive argument that has plausible initial premises. Recall, Spinoza is a rationalist, and his argument is supposed to rationally explore the nature of a potential deity as conceived by the church. And so the church, when confronted with this argument, does not accept its conclusion, but they recognize the significance of the argument because it is a valid argument. Now, ultimately, religious philosophers and theologians reject this argument. They'll introduce some modification to its premises. For instance, the most common modification is to suggest that God is all-powerful means that God's omnipotence extends only to the logically possible activities that God could engage in. Others suggest that we can't really understand how God could be omnipotent because it transcends our finite rational ability to understand. And if we had an enhanced ability, we could understand how it was that God could do something that seemed contradictory in nature to us. But however they resolved it, what they decided on was, look, a valid argument is a valid argument. And so we have to either address the underlying structural features of that argument. If we want to reject it, we have to say that the conclusion doesn't really follow from the premises, or we have to go back and re-examine the content of that argument. That is, reconsider whether or not we think that the premises are true, or whether or not we think that we can reformulate the premises in a way that better captures the truths but prevents the structure of the argument from establishing that conclusion. And these are those two elements of an effective argument. The argument's content, the truth or falsity of the initial premises, and its underlying structure, the relationships that facilitate the transference of the truth of the premises to the truth or likely truth of the conclusion.